Hello minders everywhere. Welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. Well, you probably saw this from last week's video and these are four thumbnails that I did for planning out a watercolor. Now thumbnails are a good idea anyway if you're planning a complex painting and you just want to give yourself the confidence when you go to paint. The more decisions you can make in a thumbnail or a sketch and by the way thumbnails can be done with watercolor uh, this is watercolor and gouache, transparent watercolor and gouache. You can do them in pencil. I've done thumbnails in water-soluble graphite. I've done them in marker. You can do them in charcoal. You can do thumbnails in whatever medium you want. Pastels, pastel pencils. The point is to work out the complexities of a piece. Make as many of the decisions beforehand that you can just a very, very valuable tool. Three things artists are normally trying to accomplish when they do a thumbnail. Uh, one or all three of them is to work out value and or color and or composition. In this case, uh, not too much color. I kind of knew what my color scheme was going to be, but it was composition and value. Now, one of the things I focused on with these thumbnails was planning my highlight values. And I wanted to do this for you because I've been asked so many times, well, if I'm painting in gouache, for instance, and there's a highlight, how would you do that in transparent watercolor? Since you can't just go in and paint a highlight. Uh, there's no shortcuts, you just have to do more planning. Uh, when you get to some of these very intricate edges, where it's light over dark, you're going to have to do one of two things. That's either paint around it or mask it. Now, of course, the third thing would be using opaque paint, but we're talking about transparent watercolor. So planning is almost inevitable, and uh, thumbnails make a great way to do that that don't take a lot of time. These are each about business card size. You can do them even smaller. Sometimes uh, thumbnails are just a little uh, like one and a half by one and a half thing where you just scribble with a pencil just to know what your composition is. Just all depends on what you're doing. These were fairly complex thumbnails because I wanted to know where these highlight edges were going to be. And I wanted to see how much of it I can do in transparent watercolor. But that's the level of planning that you need to do. Now this one here I think was the consensus of which one to turn into a painting first. I really would like to turn them all into paintings and I think I may. Uh, I really like these two here for demonstrating even more complexity in the masking of light highlight values. That I think would be a fun challenge. This one too though not quite as hard. I like this one just as a painting because of the interesting tree. I think that tree could be made to be very unique. But those are fairly complex. These are going to be a little easier. I actually started, and most of that background is transparent watercolor. There's actually very little gouache in this one or this one. So the challenge uh, for maintaining the highlights, protecting the highlights, is a little bit simpler. All right, so let's get started. The first step will be to draw this out. I actually re-drew this freehand. Um, you don't have to do that if you have a fairly detailed or fairly involved thumbnail. You can actually just blow that up and transfer it. I considered doing that. Part of me wishes I had. There are a few things about the thumbnail I did this from that I ended up liking better. Um, that's not unusual either. Sometimes sketches uh, with the spontaneity and the looseness and you just kind of hit on something and then trying to recreate that in a very tight drawing doesn't work. But all, all in all, I was pretty happy with this. But my point here is that you can transfer, blow up and transfer your thumbnail or you can redraw it. I, just, I chose to redraw it. And I'm usually m using mostly outlines. Now here uh, is where I'm going to keep the lightest value right there in the center of that path. And then to a lesser degree that background. I can start by laying in a broad wash of that lightest color. And I'm going to have two uh, values going on. The deeper greens on one end of my palette, which is mainly phthalo green and Prussian blue. And then the nickel azo yellow and azo green and a little bit of quin gold on the other end. I always like to have sort of opposite ends of the value and cool, warm spectrum, I guess you might say, just so I can variegate where I need to. But primarily it's just laying in this broad wash in the background and keeping the value 
very, very light. I don't need to pre-wet this. I didn't pre-wet this. Uh, this is essentially the pre-wetting. I'm just pre-wetting with this color. And everything's going to be layered on top of it. But this is going to give me the aura, the undertones that I need for the whole painting. And just doing a little bit of charging, going down on that deeper end of the greens that I mixed. Just to sort of create a halo, an aura. All haloing around that center path. Lifting up a little bit. Using the Sterling Edwards blending and glazing brush. It's a good pre-wetter too. Now the woods towards the back were negatively painted. I could have masked those edges, but I felt like I could probably paint around them enough. Just to go ahead and sort of negative paint those in. I drew every one of those trees just so I would know where I was painting. Negative painting, of course, is just painting the space around something and leaving the background color to define that object. Negative painting usually involves a darker background. And really, this was pretty easy. I had it all drawn out. As I mentioned, the only challenge were those edges for the top and the bottom foliage. This is a Winsor Newton pointed long round. That's Kalinsky Sable. But it's got a really nice needle point. So I can go up into those edges and filigree them a little bit. And, you know, that's a way to do it if uh, it, you don't need to mask everything. As I come forward, those edges are going to be a little more distinct. And I need a little bit more definition. And by the way, I drew everything mostly with just line. But I, I did a little bit of detail shading on those edges where I'm going to need to mask, just so I could see them. And all I'm doing here is, rather than negative painting, this is all going to be behind that tree. I'm just blending out some of those same greens into the background. Uh, we're going to start on that foliage on the on the the dark trees, the, the sort of silhouetted trees. It's phthalo green, some Prussian blue. Uh, I threw in, I believe, a little bit of um, violet and Quinn rose, just to keep it from getting too overly vibrant. Uh, I also I did show it there, but I put some sap green on the palette. So that as I go along, I can variegate the green a little bit. It's all going to stay very dark. But I don't want it to be like a, look like a solid color. So I'm bringing in some sap green into those other mixtures. And you can look up at the thumbnail, which is showing now, and see what it is I'm painting. It's that top canopy on the left side trees. Springing them over. And it's a very deep mixture. And this is a, another layer that can be painted without worrying about masking. Dabbing in some of the deeper values. Charging in uh, while it's wet. I'm going ahead and adding detail to the edges of the, that foliage canopy just because I want it all to meld while it's wet rather than coming back with a detail pass later. So that way I'm using the same paint, the same colors, and uh, where it does touch and meld, it, it does so uniformly. And since everything is very close to almost a silhouette, I think that works fine. So.
Now here, uh, these are the areas where I'm going to mask. And I'm going to mask over color. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and put down a very light wash uh, and actually paint those edges the way I'd like to see them. I think that's just going to show a little better under my mask. I'm using a transparent or a clear masking fluid. I'm actually out of the one I normally use, which is gray. Um, turns out, and I'll talk about this in a minute, uh, the clear actually turned out better because I could see more what was going on with the values. But uh, this is still, once I add all the dark tones, this is still going to be an extremely light value where uh, this ground underbrush is. And see, there's the edge I'm pointing to where I'm going to do a little bit of masking, especially up here, right underneath where those dark tones are going to be. Drying it out. Uh, when you apply mask, you want bone dry paper. Do not apply to wet paper. I'm just using a heat tool. You can use a, a hair dryer. Uh, if you use a heat tool, probably put it on the low setting. Uh, you can scorch paper pretty bad with a heat tool if you're not careful. Don't keep it moving. Now see those edges? Uh, those are where I'm going to mask. And I don't have to mask everything going down. Just enough of an edge so that when I paint that dark paint behind it through that area, uh, I'm not having to worry about that edge. And I have a structure that I created in the mask that uh, is already distinct and defined. All right, so always stir your mask. Never shake it or you'll get air bubbles in it. This is uh, Dr. Martin's uh, liquid mask frisket. Uh, it's kind of milky when you put it down, but it dries mm -hmm. clear. And there's only about maybe an inch of width of that edge that I'm masking, leaving a few holes where paint will show through. But again, I'm just giving myself enough of a width on the edge. And that, that's pretty much the extent you're seeing there of the width of the mask. I don't have to mask all the way down. Just so that that top edge keeps the uh, dark paint out. You can see here when I hold it in the light where I've I've passed. Done both sides now. You can see the uh, right side, and we're pretty much ready for the dark paint. The mask is completely dry. That clear mask is really hard to see, but what I do like about it, and you'll see this later when I lift it, or even now when I start to paint, you can see how the values actually work when you paint over that mask. Um, this is similar mixture. I'm keeping some of the greens, but I added more violet. So uh, saying things will start to shift on the trees a little more towards some grayed violets. This foliage is going to still be mostly greenish. Here I decided to soften everything. I, I didn't need to do that. I just, I was kind of, let's see what happens. <laughs> now you can see my strategy on masking and why I only masked just about an inch of that edge. That's all I needed. I'm starting out with a lighter wash on these trees. Um, because there will be some highlights lower down, some reflected highlights, and I'll build up the deep tones, you'll see, to where they're almost silhouetted, except for just a few select areas that are left as highlight. I think you can kind of see the shift towards a, a violet in the color. Very grayed, but less green. That was done with a quinacridone rose and some quinacridone violet added to the thalo blue, Prussian blue.
I did not draw out all of these limbs. I mainly just drew the big ones, the main ones, and I'm going in and adding a few uh, th finer branches. But it would have been difficult to try to paint around that highlighted foliage while I'm also trying to, to model the light and the washes on these trees. It's just a little bit too much to juggle at once, so that's why the masking. Just lifting some highlights on these trees, so there would be some reflected light thrown back in even if they're close to being silhouetted. All right, go time. And you can see I finished the right side in the same manner. But uh, time to lift this mask. This is always exciting to me because then I see the possibilities of adding the paint. And see, uh, now we have the effect as if I had painted all that foliage in in gouache. And obviously, uh, as in this thumbnail here, I'm going to have to work in some foreground colors. And I'm going to have to make that light fall off as it comes forward and goes out to the edge, away from the, the center aura of light coming down the path. But this is fun. This is just really getting to one of the most fun parts. And of course, you don't want that masked area to look cut out like a like a section cut out of paper. So you got to work some shadows into it, and it it gets a little darker because it comes out to the outer edges, comes forward. So I want the lightest part to be right next to the right part of that that tree. That's going to be the brightest highlights. That's what worked in my thumbnail, and I like it, so I'm carrying it through. And now we're just uh, bringing those shadows across the road. You can see I've done a similar uh, bit of work on the right side. And I want to go ahead and see uh, how the shadows look pulling those across the road. And painting in a shadow color and then coming back in places and softening it with just clear water. The shadows shift a little more towards uh, Prussian blue, Thalo blue. Some areas, uh, as it gets close to the light uh, on the bushes and underbrush, it shifts more towards green. But all the, the while, I'm letting that that sort of Nicolazzo yellow as of green kind of goldish background wash that I put in at the very beginning. All the while, that's showing through. It's creating luminosity. A different sort of look, different sort of luminosity than you get with gouache. And this piece could have been done in gouache and, and looked great, uh, but it's just a different look. You can tell the difference. It's just a preference, you know, whether you want this to look like transparent watercolor or more like gouache. I like both, actually. I get in moods for both. Um, it is a great exercise, I think, to know how to do this in transparent watercolor. Unfortunately, it's it's a planning exercise that you just have to accept that you're going to have to do. If you don't like that, then you're probably better off using gouache because you can paint to your heart's content and modify to your heart's content. I like doing both or doing either. I will say, though, I think in my thumbnail, when that comes up again, you will see that my background was a little brighter and I'm not sure what I did on this. Maybe I grayed my paint out a little more. I do know that the paper on the thumbnails, that Kilimanjaro sketchbook, I know that that was a brighter white. This is uh, Arches 140-pound cold press block, natural white, and I don't think it's quite as bright. So uh, one of the things you can do if you're looking for maximum transmission of light is use a bright white paper. 
most makers have it. I know Fabriano, Artistico has it, Arches has it. I don't have I don't have it in a block. I don't think they make it in a block, but they do have sheets of bright white. And if I do another one of those thumbnails as a painting, I'm probably going to do it on a piece of bright white watercolor paper just to get a little extra light transmission going. So at this point, we're just finessing things. Fun, fun, fun. Easy to get detailed drunk here. I could have probably stopped right there. Um, I ended up fussing it a lot after this. And you'll see a jump uh, where I stopped the video and the final shot here coming up soon. You're going to see uh, a jump, just me coming back over probably a period of a day, 24 hours, making fussy little tweaks. I'm always my worst enemy when it comes to that. Especially now, doing this voiceover, I know where the final ended up, and I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, why didn't I stop right here? But I kept working it and working it. It happens. I call it being detail drunk. That's a Princeton Elite, um, Aqua Elite, uh, one of their newer versions of the series, but they have really nice points. Big bodies, but nice points, so you can kind of get in there and fiddle details and then go right from that to a big wash. At this stage, I do a lot of squinting. Um, I'm not really detailing just for detail's sake. I'm squinting and looking at the contrast, looking where the contrast edges are, looking how uh, adding bits of contrast or detail in one area will affect the composition. So one of the things you've probably heard me say in other videos, and it really holds true, is uh, have a purpose behind your detailing. Don't just detail only for detail's sake. Um, you know, do it because it balances the composition better because it improves some aspect of the overall thing. The whole is more important to, than the parts. That was a mantra one of my painting teachers uh, from way back used to say, and I've never forgotten it. The whole is more important than the parts. So if you add detail, make sure it enhances or improves the whole, not just makes some piece of it more detailed. Great advice. And I've always tried to remember that. Although sometimes when you get into the process, you forget. But I am trying at this point when I add detail to affect composition in terms of, you know, when you add contrast in, in a particular area, it will draw your eye one way or the other. So in a way it does affect composition. Just trying to get those uh, foliage areas nicely woven into the road so we don't have too hard of a, a line. This would be a, a forest path that just sort of naturally weaves into the surrounding growth. From this point on, uh, it doesn't look a lot different, even though I'm picking at areas of contrast and edges and details and whatnot. And this is the final. Hope you got some ideas for how to take a thumbnail to a finished piece. You can see the thumbnail above and the finished piece below. Really enjoyed this one. Hope you did too. Thanks everyone for watching. Thank you so much, patrons, for your support. You guys are the best. We'll see everybody in the next video. Bye-bye.